Okay, this is the atomic theory unit. First thing we're going to go over briefly is the objectives of this screencast and this unit. First is to realize that atoms have a positively charged dense nucleus. In that nucleus are protons and neutrons, which are also together called nucleons. Outside of that nucleus are where your negatively charged electrons occupy the space called the electron cloud. Then we're going to take a brief look at a mass spectrometer. This is an instrument that is used to determine the relative atomic mass um, of an atom by giving you the relative abundance of each and then you can determine the atomic mass from that isotopic composition. Lastly, we'll take a look at the nuclear symbol notation and how to deduce the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in the isotopes of that atom and also in ions of that atom. In the atomic theory of matter, the theory that atoms are the fundamental building blocks re-emerged in the late um, 19th century. And it's interesting that they use the, the words re-emerged because initially, or the first ever, was a Greek philosopher. I am not spelling that right. Greek philosopher Democritus was the first one with the idea of atoms. And Democritus, is, this was about 300 BC. This was back when most people thought that matter was made up of uh, earth, wind, fire, and water. But Democritus had this idea, if you took a sample of matter and you divided it in half, and you divided it in half again, and half again, and half again, eventually you would have the smallest particle that still maintained the identity of that matter, and he called that an atom. So in the early 19th century, this idea kind of reemerged, and John Dalton kind of took the lead on it. Okay. And he came up with a series of postulates. Some of his postulates will be true, and some of them will be mostly true, okay, but not all of these are, um, I guess, true in their entirety. Okay. The first idea was that each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. That hopefully you know is true. His second postulate is that all atoms of a given element are identical to one another in mass and other properties, but the atoms of one element are different from the atoms of all other elements. This one is not quite true. Identical in mass. This is not true um, if you remember the definition of isotopes. Isotopes are atoms of the same element that differ sorry I don't have room to write this neither differ in the number of neutrons so isotopes are elements of the same are atoms of the same element that differ in mass and because they differ in mass, they don't. Uh, there are some differences in how they behave, and that lets us do some tracing in medical um, tests and some other things. We'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment. But that is one part of that Dalton's postulate that is not true. All atoms of the same element do have the same number of protons. Another one of his postulates, atoms of an element are not changed into atoms of a different element by chemical reactions. Okay, atoms are neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. This is hopefully recognized as the law of conservation of mass.
Another one of his postulates, compounds are formed when atoms of more than one element combined. A given compound always has the same relative number and kinds of atoms. This is true. This is known as the law of definite proportions. Now, most of Dalton's postulates actually relied on looking at mass of compounds and elements within those compounds. So his law of definite proportions really kind of states that carbon and oxygen are going to combine in whole number ratios. That sounds probably fairly elementary to you because you've grown up with these ideas of atoms. In Dalton's time, he really was just working with mass because people didn't quite accept that idea of the atom quite yet. Right? So um, that law of definite proportions really says that carbon monoxide is always going to be one carbon and one oxygen atom. Carbon dioxide is one carbon, two oxygen atoms. But if atoms combine in a compound, it's always going to be a whole number ratio. Okay, so law of def constant composition, also known as law of definite proportions. That is just what I said. Different ways of saying it. And then the law of conservation of mass. Total mass of substances present at the end of a chemical process is the same as the mass of substances present before the process took place. What we're going to do is look at some of the experiments done to determine the different types of subatomic particles, the proton, the neutron, and the electron. Okay, and in, in finding the electron, here is what the experimental setup looked like. We had streams of negatively charged particles um, emanating from cathode tubes, and that's what this red line is. If these were put through a magnet, if the the magnet on the plus side would deflect the electron or the negatively charged particles towards that magnet, if the magnet were negative, it was found that the electron or the negatively charged particles were forced away from it. J.J. Thompson is credited with the discovery of the electrons through this experimental setup. Um, he found the charge to mass ratio of the electron to be at well, about 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram. All right, and he came up with the idea of this plum pudding model. From this experiment, these, this was a vacuum tube, and I know I'm jumping around a little bit. So there was nothing in this tube where this ray could have came, came from. So the ray had to have come from this metal disc, I meant to say ray. That metal disc is matter. So this negatively charged ray had to have come from matter. And it came from neutral matter. So what he put forth was the idea of the plum pudding model. The idea was that you had this positively charged kind of pudding, and when they say pudding, think more like bread pudding, not like um, jello pudding. Okay, and within this positively charged pudding, there were little bits. Okay that was the electron. So 
So again, this negative or this positive sphere of like positive pudding with these negative electrons embedded in it. And sorry, I thought it was another slide. And what happened with the experiment is the thought that these that these electrons could jump out of this pudding and travel down in that tube. Okay. The Millikan oil drop experiment consisted of a chamber where there was uh, oil and it would drop through a chamber and from this chamber they could get the charge to mass ratio. And Millikan determined the charge of the electron. I think that's where we'll end this screencast.